Thanks, Sandy. So Sarah has touched on a lot of those instances where menopause impacts younger people. I am in that bracket, so I am in that 1%. So I was diagnosed with premature ovarian insufficiency at 32 after the birth of my son. So what I am going to talk about is a bit of a story because I think my story is um, a case of catastrophic medical neglect and it has completely changed my life. Um, For at the moment, I can't find a lot of positive reasons, to be honest. So if I get emotional, you're just going to have to deal with me because I, my son turned four yesterday and I'm really struggling with the idea, or it's not an idea, it's a fact. I'm really struggling with um, infertility um, in particular because I wanted more children and I have been going on IVF journeys with donors and they've not been successful so I actually bring to the table the sort of I don't know the the life picture of um actually how how it is much bigger than what we all call well not all of us here maybe in this room but what a lot of people flippantly call the change like for me it's it's way bigger than the change and it's actually quite serious um so I'm just sort of going to offer my perspective as a story because um, I do believe that menopause is heavily linked to puberty and also your experience with menstrual symptoms when you were younger. So I think periods and menopause are linked. So, and it's been a massive journey to even being diagnosed, to be honest with you. So it hasn't been easy and I've been fobbed off at every stage. So. Maybe this might offer some different narrative on it. So um, I started periods at a normal, kind of normal age, late, like, yeah, 14. Started periods at 14. And from the first one until I decided to go on the pill at 18, um, they were terrible. So I was very hormonal. Puberty was awful for me. I, I remember being quite hormonal and moody, but also um, very, very polar in the sense that I would kind of go from one extreme to the other quite quickly. Um, and my periods were terrible. So I would um, bleed for 10 days um, quite heavily. So I, I would not be able to sneeze or laugh or climb the stairs or um I'd have to set alarms at night to remember to change because I would just bleed through all my bed clothes and sheets and um that went on for a couple of years I didn't actually know that none of this was normal um or not normal um I have five sisters and none of my sisters would talk about it so I didn't actually know like, I didn't talk to my mum about it so I just had no idea and then one day I had such a bad period at my dad's house that he was like, I think you need to go to the doctors. And I was 15 and I went to the doctors and I eventually got diagnosed with um, anemia because I was just so exhausted because not only was I bleeding so much, I would have very short cycles. So I would have maybe a cycle every 14 to 20 days. So basically I would bleed every day of the month practically maybe a few days wait and then I just got so sick of it that went on the pill and that was the only option that was given to me at the time I also took something called transestimic acid which is basically going to reduce the flow um so as a 15 year old I was on up towards 10 pills a day um to anemia tablets all of that so when the doctor said actually you can just go on the pill at 18 I thought anything to stop them just get rid of them you know so I went on the pill at 18 and didn't think about it and I worked in marketing so I had like quite a similar sort of corporate job you know and I didn't 
think too much of the fact that I was on the pill because as a child, as a girl specifically, you are taught how not to get pregnant. So back school, I was just like, oh, I'm all right because I'm on the pill or I'm at college, I'm all right, I'm on the pill. So I did have that protection, but it wasn't because I had an active sex life. It was just to stop periods. And I just didn't really think about kids at all. And I got to 27 and I had a few boyfriends and stuff like normal. But I had this sort of big life change in that I decided to go into athletics off the back of London 2012 which is another story in itself, so it's not about that journey. But what that meant was I sort of quite quickly, from about 27, I had led a very sedentary life, so not very physically active, hated sport, and then I decided to be a sports person. (laughs) So overnight I started training at a track and so at my peak levels, I was doing upwards of half a marathon a day. And I was competing and training internationally. And I, I had got onto the world class program at British Athletics. So um, that was pretty exciting. Um, but one big aspect of uh, athletics is what you put into your body. So they would say, are you on anything? And I would be like, oh, just contraception. And and you are very heavily watched by WADA, who are the doping agency. And because I was becoming quite elite and I was sort of high up in the rankings, I knew that WADA could knock on the door and test me for anything. So I thought, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come off the pill. Even though it's safe, it's approved. I thought, well... Actually, this is a hormone pill, but I actually haven't got a clue what it does. Um, No, I wasn't having periods, and I was probably having, like, an outbreak, whatever you call it. You know that in the mid, if you stop taking the pill, you have a bleed, whatever that needs. One of those. So sometimes, though, when I was training and competing, I would choose not to, and I would run the pack so that I just didn't bleed for, sometimes I didn't bleed for months, like half a year. Anyway. So I came off the pill at 29. And when I came off the pill, my periods returned, but never, um, never regularly. So they were different this time. So they weren't every 20 days or 14 days. They were like 30, 35. And to be honest, I didn't really keep watch because all I wanted to do was get to the Paralympics. So at 31, I still wasn't thinking about kids. I was thinking about getting on that start line, being selected. So um, I kind of just kept my eye on it in a sense that I just needed to know when they were coming. Like, are they going to conflict with a big Grand Prix or a big World Championship, you know, because you don't want it then. And um, when I was sort of training and competing in Switzerland, when I was 30, so in my 2016 year, this is before I'd been selected for Rio, I started talking to some of the mums. So I was, because I was 30, I would gravitate towards the mums and not the kids because a lot of the kids in British Athletics were a lot younger. So I would talk to the mums. And I remember saying to this one woman, do you know what, Bernie? I just don't think I've had a period in about 60 days. Is that normal? I'm like, something going on there. Like, do you think, do you think like maybe menopause? And she went, no, not, not at all. But I said, well, I am bothered by it because why has it been that long? So that, that day, I managed to get in front of the doctor at British Athletics because you have on tap access to experts and medical professionals and they ask you some questions about your life and your cycles but there's never any testing so they don't test your hormone levels which blows my mind and I said to the doctor I haven't had a cycle for about 60 days and actually if I think back uh, that's happened before 
And I said, do you think it might be something to do with menopause? And she, she said, no, it's your training. You're training so hard and so long and fast and all the time constant. Your body has sort of, is um, sort of, you know, there's evidence of amenorrhea there. So don't worry about it. So I didn't. So when I got to 31, um, when I finished the Paralympics, I decided to do another year and then I retired. And when I retired, I knew that my partner wanted a baby. And I kind of did it, I, I did, to be honest, because I knew I wasn't going to have a baby while I was training. I would, I'd, I was a wheelchair racer. So you practically cannot compete with mm-hmm. a baby belly. So mm-hmm. I knew absolutely cannot get pregnant in this little window. But as soon as I retired, I'd like a few three months of party and I'm like, oh, you know, back to civilian life. And I loved it. I was like, oh, thank God I'm not shackled by the regime anymore. And I just, I just had fun for three months, you know. And it, I remember it weirdly when we agreed to start trying for a baby. It was um, January 2018. And the reason why we agreed to start is because when I retired in athletics, my periods came back for four months, regular, like clockwork. And I went, baby, it was athletics after all. It was 28 days. They were regular. So I was like, right, that's the green light. Let's crack on. <laughs> so I did. And uh, then they disappeared again. They disappeared in the December, but we only started trying in the January. And they disappeared for 69, 60, 70 days this time. So I took a pregnancy test and it was negative. So I then decided to um, activate the GP. And they said, you think we think you might have PCOS here? So I was like, oh, well, no one said anything about PCOS ever in my lifetime. So, okay, maybe, maybe it is PCOS. So I got investigated for PCOS and I had um, blood tests and, that's, and all of that. Still didn't have periods. So we're getting to February now. So um, I hadn't had a period for three months. And then when they, um, the bloods came back slightly elevated, so they said, actually, yeah, you, you're showing some signs of PCOS with your testosterone. So we're going to send you for an ultrasound scan. I said, okay. In the meantime, I went on a girl's boozy holiday. <laughs> Came back from the girl's boozy holiday. I had been the most poorly I've ever been on this holiday. My friends were like, well, clearly you just can't handle your booze anymore as a former athlete. So I... Came, home, came back and I had the ultrasound, but I said to the doctor, you know what, I'm really poorly, dizzy, nausea, weight gain, to see where I'm going with this. <laughs> and they couldn't find any sign of PCOS on this scan. So I was like, do you know what, I'm going private. So I went private through my partner's healthcare and I went to see a fertility doctor who was also a menopause not a menopause specialist, but gyne- gynecology specialist. And I started the whole investigation again. I said, right, my GP said it's not PCOS. Still not having period. I've taken two pregnancy tests. I'm not pregnant. What is going on? Four weeks later, come back in. We're going to do um, a scan for an ovarian cyst. I was like, oh, God. Like, an ovarian cyst? What, what's, all, what's going on? So uh, I made my partner wait outside the room because I was like, well, it's akin to a smear. I mean, you don't really need to come in, do you, after this? And they scanned me with a wand. Yeah. And um, they found a 12-week-old baby in there. And they said, oh, my goodness, um, you're pregnant. And I brought Matthew, my partner, into the room, and I was like, oh, I found something. And um, because I couldn't get my words out, we thought I had a tumour. And I was like, I mean, I mean, it's something good. And then I, from that day, I was pregnant. Carry on your merry way. And that doctor, given all my history, never once said, that's not normal. So you get pregnant, having not had a period for three months. 
So no one said anything. I was like, oh, yes, my body is calibrating after sport. It's, it was that. Had the baby and I was breastfeeding so you don't get periods um, as regular with breastfeeding. But I can tell you probably from about 10 days in, after the birth of my son, I went down a very significant black hole, um, which went on for months. Um, I had severe depression. I had suicidal thoughts. I had massive, massive anxiety. Everyone was telling me it was postnatal. Completely was not. I tried to climb out of the bedroom window because I thought that the house was on fire and I needed to be able to get my son out. Um, no. If I think back to it, it's it's not normal. It's not. There's so many signs there. I had brain fog. I couldn't remember the word for the window. I I was like that pane of glass, rather than the name window. I I had no libido, zero libido, which I know new mums have zero libido. But I mean, we're talking eight months in to being mm. a mum and no libido. Um, fatigue like you wouldn't believe but everyone would put it down as baby so I was so desperate that I went to A&E and I said you've got to help me I, I'm going to do something I, at this point I was self-harming anyway but I had got to 32 and never had mental health difficulties or had even done anything like self-harming so so um, what's, up, what's up with that but my period still hadn't returned a year later, they hadn't returned. And then the GP gave me antidepressants. And I felt a lot better, to be honest. Not well, but better. And I got to a place where actually I thought, I've got through that and I want another baby. So I was like, babe, can we have another baby? And we started the second, you know, trying to conceive journey. Um, and I went straight to a private doctor this time, a different one, and I said, I'm trying to conceive, but I had a few issues the first time. Can you just help me see if there's anything wrong? And within six weeks, she'd done two blood tests to assess my FSH levels. And my FSH levels were that of a 70-year-old. Um, so my FSH levels were through the roof, and I was diagnosed with POI, but I was technically post menopausal by 32 so what I'm saying is that when you knowledge is power because I definitely didn't have any understanding of any type of menstrual impact or even what menopause looks like but I just wasn't equipped but in so were none of the experts around me so it wasn't just me that wasn't equipped it was the institutions that I was around. It was the complete lack of care for women's issues. It was the way that women are erased and dismissed a lot in the conversation. Um, and it has an impact because now, two years later, I've got failed IVF cycles under my belt. I've got osteopenia. I've got no clarity as to why I have POI, other than I'm told that 90% of women don't have a reason that it's idiopathic. Um, there's no genetic link. My mum's the most fertile woman on the planet. She had her sixth baby at 37, and I'm 37 this in a couple of weeks. So I'm a bit like, I've lost my opportunity. But what is ang what angers me about it is that complete lack of any type of research or any type of like ongoing investment in women's health. And when I raised it at 29 slash 30, when I came off the pill and I raised it and said things aren't right, I was dismissed. But that would have been my window for freezing what was left. So it does um, have real ramifications if women are not empowered, but also if other people around us are not empowered. So I'm aware that I've probably taken ages telling you that story, but it was so complex That's that I couldn't just be like, yeah, I've no. gone through it because it's 
everything is so linked you yeah, know really. hindsight is a wonderful thing yeah no thank you i was no way gonna cut you short carly from telling us oh, that story well, I'll shut up now i've done my um, bit no <laughs> thank you so much for trusting us with that um with that story that you shared there um i feel very honored that you um i feel a bit emotional about that but um almost oh, me too me too like my little boy turned four yesterday and i'm just like oh my god i'm out of the baby stage and i'm just desperate for a baby like it's so hard to be so desperate for something oh, that you no, can't, I know. I that know, you can't have very well. <laughs> it's horrible and i'm just yeah. like i feel so lucky i do but i i think menopause is not just menopause it's your hurt it's your health your brain health your 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 body health, your biological health, it's fertility, it's hormonal health. There's so many other things that go around it. So we talk about menopause and silo and it isn't a, no, a siloed thing. I mean, you touched on um, a very, you know, a, a universal subject there, which is medical trauma and gaslighting. And mm. as women, we we are invisible. We are ignored. We are it's, it's documented and yeah. it's been going on for centuries uh again i i really hope that what we are doing now is going to have an impact i don't think it's going to turn it on its head i'm not naive enough to think that but i do think that we uh are going to help start the change um so I I think from your story, I'm I'm hoping, Carly, that it will help educate people and the ripple effect, you know, what you have said here will that's such an important story that will stick in people's minds and people will tell people will tell people. Because if we know and we trust you trusted your body and nobody listened, but if we but if we can learn to trust our bodies combined with more education, combined with the experts getting more education and being strong enough to say, no, 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 I do think that this is going to be something to do with menopause and I want you to, to test for it. And having that knowledge to be able to say, if you're not going to test for it, I want you to write in my notes that you've refused that because we're allowed to do that but people don't know those things so but women don't even know that you can have a blood test to test yeah, so these, like i'm like oh these I are to the go. you know i think from some of the symptoms you talked about um hormonal hormonal changes can cause psychosis you know they're talking about climbing out of the wall out the window and things uh we, we we're not told about that that's you know women were just called witches and burnt in asylums you get in there you're mad yeah woman, so like, hopefully hopefully we're mm. changing things that's and, like, and my partner i think my partner literally had ptsd for well, living through that yeah. i mean obviously i i trump with the lived experience but sometimes he says oh you can't really ignore what i went through and i'm like well yeah true to be fair because you have to watch me do stuff like this and somehow how experience so um but yes thank you because of you telling your story like that it's that's how change happens so thank you for for sharing your truth with us carly that has touched me very deeply <laughs>